All right, we're in. So welcome everyone. Uh, we are finally restarting the usual, the regular sessions for the research user group. And um, this was a topic that we had already for a while uh, on Cilium and UBBF that had been suggested before. And we got uh, Raphael from Isovalent that uh, was nice enough to, to, to join us today. So uh, we'll have a presentation. So usually the format is like half an hour and then we, we, we leave plenty of time for questions. But uh, I guess if people have uh, questions during the presentation, that should be also okay. So yeah, thanks again, Rafael. Thanks. So I guess I'll start by sharing my screen. Um, there's this here. All right, is that fine? Yep. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's talk about Cilium. I put Cilium in France, Cilium in general, Cilium EBPF, and uh, the tools around Cilium. So my name is Raphael Benson. I'm a solutions architect at Isovalent based in Switzerland. Um, and so as part of my job as solutions architect, I do uh, customer support on Cilium, uh, Hubble, Tetragon. Um, and I've been involved with, with Kubernetes in the CNCF for several years. I actually co-organized um, a CNCF meetup uh, in, in the Romandie part of Switzerland. So the different subjects we can touch on today are Cilium and eBPF in general, then different uh, features of Cilium, uh, networking, cluster mesh, security observability, a bit on service mesh, and uh, I'll leave a little bit on Tetragon at the end, which is not uh, extremely related to Cilium, but we usually ship it together, at least in our enterprise uh, so solution. So first, Cilium and eBPF, quick introduction. So. Uh, I'm part of Isovalent. Isovalent is the main contributor to Cilium, and Cilium is part of the CNCF. It's an incubating project at the moment, and uh, based usually on eBPF, eBPF being a technology that has been in the Linux kernel for years, and it's now actually being ported to other kernels. Microsoft is doing some work to port it to Windows, for example. So what is Cilium? Uh, these days, I would say Cilium is first and foremost a CNI, though it actually started um, before Kubernetes was uh, widespread or even announced, I think. Uh, so it provides the, the pod to pod, pod to service to pod communication, uh, even node to node communication. But it can also implement Kubernetes services or a replacement for QProxy, as well as extra features such as multi-cluster or VM gateway, which is an extension of the multi-cluster feature. Uh, on top of this, it implements network policies using either the standard Kubernetes network policies uh, uh, resource type or specific network policies, TRDs, provided by Cilium for advanced features. Uh, it is identity-based, and this is something very important. There is a the duplication of identities that happen in Cilium, uh, both for uh, performance and uh, it improves the, the visibility, the observability um, layer. It supports uh, encryption, pod to pod encryption using uh, IPsec or WireGuard. And there's also observability, um, mainly linked to the Hubble components, providing metrics, providing uh, flow visibility, and service dependency in the form of a service map. All of this is based on eBPF and um, extending the Linux kernel using eBPF. So what is eBPF? eBPF is a technology that allows to dynamically extend the features of the, of the kernel. So currently, in our case, the Linux kernel, in the future, it might extend to other OSs. And so the idea is that you can uh, have many programs that are typically injected in, into the kernel as bytecode, so BPF bytecode, uh, usually written in some form, some subset of C, uh, like the example here, that is uh, compiled into bytecode and then injected into a kernel. And then the kernel will verify that this program is acceptable so there is a strict verifier that verifies for both uh, security and stability of that program. And then once the program is accepted into the kernel, it will be compiled into uh, uh, machine code so, so that it's as performant as the kernel itself. And you can attach it to different events in the kernel, which is, it, it makes a lot of sense given that the kernel itself is essentially an event-driven uh, program. So, for example, without a BPF, a process would uh, call an execv syscall to start a new process, and that syscall would be scheduled. 
um, with a DPF, you can actually capture that syscall and decide to observe it or even to act on the syscall itself, even prevent it. So the example here, for example, is an example of observability in the kernel. There's um, several fields of application that are quite natural for eBPF. Um, uh, observability is obviously one of them because you get to observe anything that happens in the kernel in forms of syscalls or K probes, U probes, lots of different things, or um, uh, network events. Uh, another field of application is security, obviously. If you can act directly on the syscalls, even block them, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the last one is networking. I say the last one, although in the case of the ceiling project, this is where the project started actually with networking. Uh, it's a little bit less obvious, but with the BPF, you can also bypass some uh, native, uh, native uh, networking stacks in the kernel and actually re-implement them. So different ways in which eBPF programs can act on events in a kernel. You can typically add yourself, uh, attach yourself to events such as a file being read uh, or the IO read directly on the disk and do some observability or some action on this. Uh, when it comes to networking, you can attach to a connect event or uh, to the send packet event, or you could even implement a TCP retransmission uh, by attaching yourself to a TCP IP uh, event. You can attach yourself to K probes, U probes, system calls, trace points, sockets, and so on. And there's even ways actually to interact directly with, um, with the, the hardware uh, using XDP, for example, so Express Data Pass, which allows to program um, um, hardware network devices uh, to do load balancing, for example. So you could capture packets arriving on an interface in a kernel and redirect them directly to, um, to a network card for load balancing, for hardware load balancing, which can give amazing performance compared to what the kernel itself can do. So Cilium is used by a lot of different companies. This is just an extract from users.md in the, in, the, in the repository, in the Cilium repository. There's lots of uh, names of uh, organizations that use Cilium and what they do with it. So at the moment, when we talk about Cilium, there's essentially three products that are part of the Cilium project and that are in, in this scope part of the, the CNCF. Um, there's Cilium itself, so the, the CNI and networking solution, there's Hubble, which is the ob observability component, and Tetragon, which is the most recently open source component that is responsible for uh, runtime uh, security as well as um, uh, security uh, observability. So uh, the Cilium networking component, the CNI itself, is responsible for the networking side of things, IPv4, IPv6, integration into uh, cloud providers or BGP if you're doing on-premise typically. Um, overlay, so there's two options, either direct routing using BGP or overlay using VXLAN or Geneve. Uh, SRV6, uh, there's special features such as egress gateway and multi-cluster, the possibility of, do, of doing NAT uh, 4664, and uh, the possibility of applying network policies, so L3, L4, that's kind of the standard, all the way to layer 7 using Envoy as a proxy and uh, filtering on DNS entries, uh, either uh, specific DNS entries or with wildcards. Encryption, I mentioned this a bit before, and load balancing, which can be done actually even outside of uh, Kubernetes. So either Kubernetes load balancing as a replacement for Kubeproxy or even outside of Kubernetes as a standalone load balancer using Cilium as a container in Docker, for example. And on top of this, because we see all the traffic going through, we can actually add a lot of observability. So observe uh, traffic in the form of uh, flows, but we also get a lot of metrics from all these components, the Cilium agent itself, uh, the Cilium operator, uh, Hubble, uh, the Envoy proxy, Tetragon, and so on. Um, I'll talk a bit about Tetragon here. Tetragon allows to plug to a lot of different kernel events and actually observe what's happening there. You can get a lot of um, observability flows from there, which can be exported to the same of your, of your choice, same for Hubble. So essentially you get a flow of uh, JSON events that you can export and process in your tool of choice. Um, or you can use uh, the tools that are provided and typically in the enterprise solution of Cilium provided by Azovalent, we have ways of correlating this event. And then there's the service mesh uh, layer 
um, that is essentially using features that we already have in Cilium and that people expect in a service mesh, such as encryption, such as cluster mesh, such as observability, and adding to it the features that people would expect as well in service mesh, such as an ingress controller, uh, authentication, traffic management, and there's quite a bit of work that is still done on this layer and will come in Selenium 113 and, and following. So next, next uh, release and following. So let's dive a bit into the networking side of things. Uh, typically on Kubernetes, there is no default um, network layer. There's only a standard, which is CNI. And so here, uh, Cilium can replace both the CNI uh, layer as well as kubeproxy. Uh, so the CNI will be pod to pod, uh, intranode, internode communication. Uh, and replacing kubeproxy will actually implement the services which are usually implemented using IP tables or IPVS in kubeproxy. So we can have Cilium take care of all of this. And typically, instead of IP tables on every node, Cilium will inject eBPF programs and maps to, uh, to implement the same features, um, except they, they might be, it might be a little bit more featureful because eBPF programs are, uh, have more possibilities than just IP table rules. So there is, sorry, I'll get back to this. There is an agent, uh, a Cilium agent running on each node, and this agent is responsible for injecting eBPF programs and eBPF maps that are used either to configure these programs or to retrieve information for this, from these programs, typically for observability, for example. So if we talk about services and the possibility to replace kubeproxy, uh, typically um, on Kubernetes, when you have a service, you have a, a virtual IP that uh, works as an L3, L4 load balancer to pods uh, in the back and point. And this is typically uh, implemented using IP tables in kubeproxy or IPVS. And with IP tables, what you get is essentially a system of seed. We will go through all the rules before you find the rule that is uh, proper for you, that applies in your case. So typically, if you have a service with three uh, uh, pods in, in, in the back, uh, you'll have three role and three roles, and the first one will say, uh, redirect to this pod, to this IP uh, in 33% of the cases, and then redirect to the second IP in 50% of the cases, and then redirect to this IP in 100% of the of the remaining cases. So you see this is a very, um, uh, an, an approach that is based on filtering. And when you get to hundreds or thousands of services, it can get really slow to get to the rule that you need to apply. Uh, let alone just applying the, the rules whenever there's a new pod or whenever there's a new service or whenever there's a modification in the network policy, uh, the whole stack, the whole um, list of uh, IP tables need to be rewritten. Whereas with an eBPF based approach, uh, we can have um, uh, hash tables that will link directly the identity instead of the IP address, the identity of a pod based on a set of labels that are known uh, from Kubernetes by the uh, eBPF program. And based on this identity, you can link directly to the way it should be routed to another identity, or if this, um, this traffic should be allowed or not. So typically, both routing and network policies can be implemented in a much more performant and scalable way. Uh, one of the examples of features that, that are provided in Cilium that is interesting is uh, the possibility of having an ingress gateway to access um, a, a workload, typically um, a database, for example, outside of the Kubernetes cluster. And so we have a CRD that is called egress network policy, Cilium egress net, net policy, actually, that allows you to target some pods in the Kubernetes cluster and say, when coming from this pod and accessing this CIDR outside of the Kubernetes cluster, uh, I want to go through this specific IP or this specific node of the cluster. And this allows the, the application outside of the cluster to know, uh, to, to recognize the IP that it's coming from. So typically, if you have a firewall in front of this application, you can filter on this IP. Otherwise, you don't know exactly which IP would be coming out, right? It could be from the node itself, or it could be directly from the pod if you're using direct routing. But it would be really hard to identify which application is reaching out to this external um, uh, application outside of the cluster. There's actually a mode that is provided in the uh, ISO Valencia Enterprise uh, distribution, which allows for high availability uh, egress gateway. So instead of having one IP to exit the cluster, we have several 
and psyllium can load balance between them and fail over as well in case one of the nodes uh, actually uh, is not available. Platform integration is very important. Uh, There's some uh, Kubernetes distributions that are very opinionated when it comes to networking. Uh, typically, if you take the case of Amazon EKS, for example, it needs to work in a direct routing uh, approach using IPs that are provided by AWS for the VPC. Um, and so uh, Cilium has a way to integrate, connect to uh, these different clouds in order to get the proper IPs, in order to integrate with uh, rules as well, like security groups or other metadata from the cloud. So typically we have uh, a component called the Cilium operator. Uh, and while the agent is a daemon set running on every node in the cluster, the operator is a deployment that has the credentials to connect to the cloud. Um, and it will allow typically to uh, uh, play a role in the IPAM for uh, Cilium, uh, getting the, the sets of IPs that are available to assign to the pods in a direct routing uh, environment, such as EKS, for example. But it would be similar for uh, GKE or uh, other approaches. Uh, this operator also has a role to do uh, some um, uh, garbage collecting in the cluster in the case, for example, one node is removed. Obviously, the agent on this node is not there anymore to remove stuff from the uh, from the API server, so the operator can do this. There's a possibility to do CNI chaining, so using one CNI as the base layer and then deploying Cilium on top. Some people want to do this. It's more and more rare, I would say. Um, the typical case is because they don't want to lose possible uh, support from the cloud provider by using something else. Fortunately, Cilium is getting more and more uh, common and supported by cloud providers, so it's not necessary to use CNI chaining anymore in a lot of cases. As for the networking part, um, one specific feature that is interesting is the possibility of meshing different clusters at L3, L4. So typically, we can have clusters that have different uh, Kubernetes distri uh, distributions, uh, different uh, Kubernetes versions even and you want to mesh them directly uh, at the L3, L4 layer. Uh, this is possible uh, using Cilium, and the way this is done is that when you activate cluster mesh on a cluster, Cilium will create a new API server on, on this cluster, and this API server will be used by the agents on the other cluster to get information read-only from the first cluster. So typically, they'll be able to share uh, service discovery information, the, the services and the backends, the, the endpoints for the services, uh, and to perform load balancing between the different clusters. You can also share network policies. So typically, you can have network policies with the labels that uh, labels that typically target one or the other cluster. So you can say this backend from this cluster is allowed to talk to this front end, or the other way, actually. <laughs> this front end from this cluster is allowed to talk to this back end on the other cluster. And this allows for cross-cluster network policies. Encryption can also be extended between the two clusters, as well as obviously routing. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. So typically, this allows to deploy the same workloads on two clusters and make sure that if the workload is not available on one cluster, it will fail over to the other cluster. Um, another option is to have several clusters with shared services. So here, I have a service that is global between the three clusters, but I don't actually have pods on cluster one or cluster two to implement it. The pods are only on the shared services cluster. And typically, one use of this is using a stateful cluster where I have uh, like a database running, and I can easily scale this cluster. So I'm, I'm keeping it um, um, as, a, as a spot in my architecture, whereas I might have stateless clusters or the clusters that are dedicated to stateless applications that can scale at will on different uh, availability zones, for example, or even different providers. And then I'll have uh, a virtual service here that provides access to my uh, database. And this service will be made global uh, in a cluster mesh approach so that it actually points to the stateful cluster. It's also possible to integrate with um, service mesh, so typically having an ingress in front of each cluster and then making sure that the backend service is always accessible using either the local pods or the remote pods. And in the latest version of Cilium, you can actually specify if you want a local or a remote affinity. So if you have a local affinity, you will say, preferably, when I access the service, I want to access the local pod pods on my cluster. If there's no such pods, then go to the other cluster to 
uh, fulfill the service uh, access. So that's the, the case for remote. It looks like this. It's actually a normal service uh, definition, except it has annotations for global service and for service affinity. There's actually other options available for this, but just to give an example. Let's dive into security. Uh, like I said, security is very important in Cilium, and it's uh, clearly based on identity. And I I've shown you how you know uh, Cilium can use a concept of identities that is native to it and that associates uh, labels uh, in Kubernetes workloads directly to their identity. This identity, in the case of VXLAN, can actually be um, uh, transmitted, encapsulated into the, the network packets uh, going from one node to the other so that the identity is propagated between nodes, uh, typically for observability and network policy applications. In the case of direct routing, it works a little bit differently, but the idea is that every time something uh, a, a network flow arrives on a node, there is a, no, a knowledge of this identity, uh, which allows for uh, advanced observability and network policy enforcement based on this identity. Based on this, we can have three layers, three levels of um, network policy application, either L3, so just connection between two pods, L4, connection plus the port or protocol, TCP, uh, UDP, and L7, which allows to actually parse the, um, the application uh, networking layer and uh, extract the, the protocol, the application protocol, and filter on this. So typically you can allow HTTP get on slash public, that's an example. And in this case, it will actually go through uh, an Envoy proxy provided with Cilium on every, on every agent. This is an example of L7 filtering using Cassandra. And you can see here that we're specifically allowing one action select on one table. There's a possibility as well in network policies to filter on DNS. Uh, so typically when uh, traffic is exiting the cluster at the moment, we have a 2FQDN rule, and you can actually use either uh, exact DNS names or even wildcards. And the way it works is that Cilium will cache the answers from kubeDNS or core DNS and allow uh, connections to IPs that are known based on the resolution that was cached. There's an HA uh, option for DNS proxy so that when the agent uh, gets upgraded or if the agent crashes, which shouldn't happen, the DNS proxy continues to work. And this uh, HA option is available in the isovalent uh, Cilium Enterprise distribution. So these are all the, the possibilities of matching for network policies. Um, all the, the standard things like pod labels, namespace, uh, service accounts, service names, cluster names as well when using uh, cluster mesh. Uh, DNS names, I just talked about this, uh, ciders, either inter, uh, well, external ciders in this case, cloud providers, and this is one role of the Cilium operator is to actually resolve instance labels or uh, subnets or uh, security group names into ciders. And in, uh, logical entities, logical entities can be uh, the host on which the pod is running, the container is running typically, um, it can be another host in the clusters, so and that would be the remote node uh, entity. It can be the API server. It can be the world. It can be anything in the cluster. So we have logical entities allowing to write advanced rules without caring about IP addresses. Observability, because again, we see everything going through. We can have great observability uh, thanks to uh, eBPF, and we have several ways of accessing it, typically through a CLI, so a Hubble CLI, or Hubble UI, and both of them use a component that we call Hubble Relay, which gathers all the observability flows from all the nodes in the cluster and allow you to filter them and, and view them either on CLI or uh, with the UI. And on top of this, every one of the components, Cilium Agent, Cilium Operator, uh, Hubble, um, the Envoy Proxy, the DNS Proxy, they all provide metrics which you can send to your favorite, um, to your favorite, um, uh, observability platform, right? Because they're Prometheus metrics, essentially. So this is an example of the Hubble CLI. So here we have some pods running. And with the Hubble CLI, you can see traffic going through your cluster. So here we see the DNS lookup that a pod is doing to core DNS. We see the reply in UDP, and you see the IDs that are associated. Uh, the HTTPS requests. And here we see we have uh, DNS visibility, actually. the, the IPs are replaced with the DNS names that are known to be associated in the cache. 
Um, and we can even see here when uh, traffic is blocked. So that's a, a network policy being applied. And here the traffic is dropped uh, at the same uh, request, TCP request. So this is the, the CLI, this is the UI for Hubble. This is the open source version of the UI. The Isovalent uh, Slim Enterprise has a slightly different uh, version of it with a few more features. And essentially this uses the same source of information as the CLI, except uh, it actually builds uh, a graph of dependencies between the pods, between the pods, the services, uh, that shows how they actually communicate. So here you only see gray uh, lines it could be red lines as well if traffic has been dropped. So you can see where it's being dropped and you can actually click on the boxes to get more information. And here in this case, in this namespace, you can see that uh, HTTP visibility using the uh, Envoy proxy has been activated because you see actually which HTTP requests were performed on which services. And here you have the flows and you can click on the flows to get more information on every one of them. I'll finish the Cilium site with Service Mesh. Uh, this is the extension. This is where, where we're going at the moment because we know that people are interested in this part and Cilium is quite low level, but a lot of people are interested in features that are a bit higher level. And the idea is that Cilium already has a lot of the features that people expect from Service Mesh. So one thing we've added in Cilium 112 is the possibility of programming the Envoy proxy that is already provided with the Cilium agent using a CRD. So Cilium 112 provides a Cilium Envoy config CRD that allows to program your uh, the Envoy proxy on every node uh, using logical identity. So you can say from this pods to this pods, I want to apply this uh, Envoy configuration. And one um, layer of control plane that we've added in Cilium 112 is an ingress controller that bases itself on it. So essentially, now you can use the Cilium ingress class uh, if you've activated the ingress controller, obviously. And this Cilium ingress class will, will essentially implement the ingress by uh, creating an Envoy configuration dynamically uh, for the ingress for a specific pod. Uh, in the future, what we're adding, what we're currently working on is support for the gateway API and support for uh, Spiffy for a form of mutual authentication directly implemented in Cilium. This is planned for 113 for the next major release of Cilium. Uh, you can already use Istio <coughs> with Cilium as a, sorry, as, as an overlay on top of Cilium, but we're also planning in the future to integrate Istio so that it uses the Envoy CRD natively uh, as, a, as, as the implementation for, for the Istio abstraction instead of injecting an Envoy proxy into every pod like it does currently. All of these actually also allow to get metrics and to get observability in the form of flows. Uh, in Isovalin Slim Enterprise, we actually provide a FluentD um, um, service, which allows to easily export all the, the flows that we have, either from Hubble or from Tetragon, to your favorite uh, SIM platform. We also have a component called Hubble uh, Hotel that can turn Hubble flows into uh, open telemetry traces. So you can import this as well and correlate it with the traces from your applications. So the way we're seeing this is just, just the way that uh, some decades ago, um, TCP went down from being an external library uh, to being a standard library to being uh, uh, emptied in the kernel so that everyone can use TCP without even thinking about it. We think that a lot of the features and service meshes today uh, that started at, as libraries that you had to use in your application for instrumentation are now at the uh, external implementation uh, in the form of sidecar uh, step and we think it could go even lower uh, into the kernel uh, obviously not patching the kernel uh, the way it was done for tcp back in the day but using ebpf to inject this feature so that it becomes totally transparent for the users and it's just there observability encryption uh, mutual authentication and so on we also gain a lot, obviously, in performance because instead of having one um, one proxy, one Envoy proxy per pod, which means a lot of uh, Envoy proxies running on your nodes, if you only have one per node, you gain a lot in CPUs and CPU and RAM typically. So the the view that the idea is whatever we can do natively in eBPF, we try to do natively in eBPF, including observability, security, traffic management, because we gain a lot in performance. And whatever we can't do natively in eBPF, we can still use an external proxy 
for it. And eDPF can still allow to directly route into this Envoy proxy provided per node. So we still get in performance compared to a sidecar. Uh, the performances, uh, th this is um, a graph that compares performances uh, based on uh, a proxy um, or the, the visibility directly in a kernel using eDPF. Uh, note that some of the, the Cilium uh, projects actually use uh, directly eDPF-based HTTP visibility. This is the case of Tetragon, for example. And it's totally possible that in the future, we might actually uh, use these libraries that already exist to parse HTTP or other la layer 7 protocols directly in the kernel to gain performance again. So last point on Tetragon and system uh, observability and, and enforcement. So Tetragon is kind of a complement. It's been in the ISOVL and Cinema Enterprise offer for many years as a, a closed source product, and it was open source in the beginning of this year as a complement to Cilium and Hubble. And it can attach to a lot of different events in the kernel and provide observability. The, the really nice thing about this is that because of eBPF, we can do uh, correlation uh, and aggregation of events directly in the kernel using maps so that we export from the kernel into user space only what you want to see already um, organized, already aggregated. And this is a huge gain in, in performance. And then based on this, in user space, you'll have the Tetragon agent, agents sorry, that will read from the different structures in which the VPF programs have written, extract the information, and make them available as metrics or as flows of information, uh, flows of events, logs, or traces. Based on this, you can observe a lot of things, uh, file access, uh, network, uh, namespace uh, escapes, privilege escalation, access to uh, data on disk, uh, network uh, protocols, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the um, users that we have, and this is an example from ISOVILLE and Cilium Enterprise, where we have a process tree view that has ex existed for many years, where we have a correlation between what's actually running into a, inside a container and the network flows that result from it. So maybe you see in Hubble, hey, there was a connection to this weird thing here, uh, something that not reverse shell.com, which is definitely not a reverse shell, right? And you want to see where it came from. You know in Hubble that it came from this pod. And so in this view here, you can actually look into this pod, see exactly what was executed in this pod. This uses Tetracon. And you can see that uh, five minutes after the, the, the server.js uh, standard application in the container started, there was a, a shell that was started, and an NC, and then a curl that connected to uh, Elasticsearch. And you can say, OK, there's something fishy here. But at least you have a trace of what was executed and what gave um, what, what led to this network traffic that you could observe in Hubble. So uh, there's some information, again, on uh, isovalent.com. We have some, some labs with uh, some of the features, both open source and enterprise uh, features in these labs. Um, and the community, obviously, there's the, the Slack and eBPF uh, community Slack server. And there's eBPF.io when it comes to eBPF itself. Awesome. That was awesome and a lot of information. So um, I guess we can, we have plenty of time for discussion. Any questions? Straight in. I don't have any specific questions, but um, I've seen that before and it's really, really exciting. I mean, we, we are planning to, I think you probably know already actually in GR planning to use it, use Cilium. Um, we've had to implement some very basic features ourselves previously, and this will allow us to get rid of all of that sort of accumulated tech debt, I suppose. But yeah, it looks really, really powerful. So it's good stuff. So we, we, actually, Jamie, out of curiosity, which features are you mostly looking at? Uh, well, there's a few things we wanted for. I mean, we haven't implemented this ourselves. We just haven't got a solution for it, but really basic stuff like well, basically, but being able to see, you know, real product, real source IPs and that kind of stuff for our, our traffic coming into our clusters. Um, the Tetracon stuff's really exciting because we can use that. We've got a lot of requirements around that. Uh, the things we have implemented ourselves are more around the sort of service meshy kind of stuff. So the concept of like egress gateways and that kind of thing, we've 
we use Envoy ourselves and configure it to do this kind of thing. Um, and then I've also seen um, seen demo of the whole uh, sort of almost like a sort of global network policy thing working across us too, which is really exciting. Uh, but we've had to come up with, I guess we've pieced this together ourselves using existing Kubernetes um, primitives and CNCF stuff and having something like this which wraps it all up for us is a, an attractive proposition. Um, we've used Calico for a long time as our CNI and generally it's been okay, but it's exciting to try something new and BPPF just opens up a whole load of new avenues for us. I don't know if you guys, Ricardo, have you done anything with in this space? Yeah, so actually we, we, we discussed with Raphael very recently about this as well, but uh, the one of the main things that we've been looking at is uh, the possibility of doing cluster mesh. Uh, and this is for, uh, because we still push for people to have this uh, kind of uh, disposable clusters and to have uh, applications deployed across multiple clusters instead of having uh, clusters that need to be upgraded in place and things like this. And uh, for stateful workloads, this is uh, this can be problematic. So we've been looking at cluster mesh to kind of uh, expand the boundaries uh, cross cluster, which would allow us to potentially do to use this model even for things that have stateful uh, workloads running, like databases or uh, I don't know. We have some we have some even even for like batch or ML uh, where you have long running jobs. So but we, we can manage this in a better way. So this is something we're looking at. Oh, so you're considering specifically the, the shared service model? With, the, like, uh, with like a stateful cluster and then several stateless clusters that would access the services on the stateful cluster in a transparent way using global so, services. So yeah, yeah. So that's that's one 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 option, and the other one is even to do uh, to um, run the stateful workloads that have multiple replicas across across multiple clusters. Even if we have node-to-node -node connectivity, which we okay. have for on premises, then we could consider even having replicas in multiple clusters and and um, yeah, eventually just just make them also kind of uh, disposable as we add more uh, it really depends mm -hmm. on the workload of course how easy this is to do but uh but by having uh mesh for the pods and even like one one thing i don't know if you mentioned or not but the, even this um restriction that exists today that i know will disappear about having a non-overlapping subnets across multiple clusters this is not yes. really a big deal for us because we orchestrate everything centrally but uh yeah it will become simpler. Um, so I, I had uh, one more to mention. Uh, maybe Timothy, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a quick question around uh, how does it compare to add morality in that in that sort of feature space? Um, I can't answer. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it, I wouldn't be able to. It just, this. It's sort of like, yeah, so that morality is sort of like uh, the ability to federate uh, clusters. So, you know, uh -huh. um, run one workload from one cluster into another. It sounded like that there was a lot of those types of features uh, to provide some sort of federation. The use case um, I'm looking at is, is sort of like on prem cloud bursting type things where, um, you know, you have an on prem uh, cluster and then you, you provide. Uh, a cloud bursting capability and sort of stitch those together in, in some sort of manner. Right. So I, I don't know because I haven't l looked at Admiralty. Is it? Well, no, I'm just thinking in terms now. of uh, not necessarily Admiralty. That's that's the use case that it's currently being used for. It just does. Can you do those types of things you know, within CLM? I might be able to answer that actually. I know. I think Admiralty was more around. Um, Sort of federated deployment of applications rather than accessing them. So that would be a single pane of glass to deploy stuff and have it replicated in lots of different clusters and environments. Where sitting is more around the, the, I suppose the CNI and the network access to applications in multiple clusters and stitching them together post deployment. I don't think Cilium does any kind of deployment of applications for you. So, but yeah. you, but from a what we're trying to accomplish, you can you could build. Could you do that bursting type of federated uh, thing 
uh, across multiple clusters. So actually, th that was uh, the other point I wanted to say that we are looking at, and I already mentioned it to Raphael, which is exactly that. It's uh, the ability to do sort of cluster mesh across uh, uh, regions or data centers, uh, uh, which means that you won't have necessarily node-to-node -node con connectivity because you might not have a VPN or something that will allow this. Uh, the way Admiralty, I am also not an expert, but the, my understanding is that the way it, it works, it kind of has like a, um, a kind of gateway pods that then communicate to the remote ones. Uh, so it kind right, of hides. So similar to what Istio would do it, I guess. Yeah, but it, but it's it's really targeting not only the services, but also the kind of batch workloads where you could submit pods to a cluster that then the actual workloads run in a remote cluster and they are kind of... Uh, tracked through pods in local clusters uh, mm -hmm. with with uh with Cilium, potentially we could do this uh, transparently at the cluster level like we do with cluster mesh but we would need this kind of cross boundary communication without uh necessarily have a vpn or something like that i think that's kind of timothy the use case here also describing. yeah in some sense i was looking for motivation to dive into this a little bit further because you know these are not simple uh, platforms to to wrap your head around. So that was enough motivation to go to go do some deeper research and uh, maybe potentially do yeah. some POCs. Thanks. Yeah, but but maybe we take this kind of. Uh, I, I had one more question to Rafael, but maybe we take this as a kind of uh, action item on the group and also Cilium, which is to track how how visible this uh, this model is with Cilium, which is to kind of burst um, um, more than just uh, across clusters, but across uh, uh, network boundaries. Um, so we have we have customers that do this, but they actually have VPN between the different right. regions. But maybe it's worth, uh, because I, I have the feeling that several labs will be interested in this kind of functionality, so maybe if we mm -hmm. summarize this, it would be nice for everyone. The The other question I had was, uh, like, uh, Jamie also mentioned that he's, uh, they're using Calico. Is there anything that is worth knowing if people would move from Calico to Cilium? Uh, is there something that uh, that would be lost or to, to be uh, considered? I guess this would be a question for Raphael, just uh, if you know like of other people that have done this transition from Calico to Cilium, if there's anything specific um, to consider, or no. if it's just transparent. I, I haven't heard of anything specifically. Uh, for us, we, have, we will have some dependency on, because we have implemented some network policy as Calico specific network policies. So that would have to yeah, change. So the, the migration, yeah migration yeah. of network policies, but there's no, as far as I know, there's no specific feature in Calico that you wouldn't have in selling. Yeah. And obviously this is kind of like a fundamental thing. So you wouldn't migrate a cluster in place with build new clusters with the, the new CMI, I take it. I, ideally, yeah, this is what would be recommended to start a new cluster with, with Cilium and redeploy. And if yeah. you have, if you have a good GitOps approach, it shouldn't be too complicated theoretically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not always the case, but yeah. If you just have one sort of pet cluster that you, you nurse every day, then you have a problem. But yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> there will always be one. Yeah. Yeah, I won't name anyone, but you know, people using hyperconvergent databases on the cluster, and and then this cluster becomes a little gem that you can't touch or reinstall or replace anymore. Yeah. There's a enterprise versus open source aspect here as well, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, what about on the enterprise side of things? Do we have are there any sort of extra complexity around licensing and that kind of stuff, as in stuff you have to set up, or does it just work? No, no. At the moment, it's just different images, uh, different helm charts, but there's no there's no license per se, and, and so. Okay. Things that I've seen in the past with products where actually it's sometimes the most annoying thing about using the enterprise edition, even though even apart from paying for it, is 
Oh, and then you have to provide license keys and set up some complex infrastructure, and especially if you're on-prem and don't have internet access, then it all gets a bit difficult. But that's a bit of yeah, so at, at the moment, it's not like this. It's just, in fact, you can actually upgrade from Cilium open source to Cilium enterprise. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other question I see? Feel free to come forward if you have questions. All right. Otherwise, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah, Alex, yeah, it was a late, a late announcement. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, you did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I guess I, I was just trying to summarize uh, what uh, the main motivations uh, are from 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 this community to to move to Ceylon. And I guess the ones we we got here were um, uh, the ability to do cluster mesh, potentially doing hybrid bursting things. And then uh, Jamie, you mentioned because you 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 have quite a lot of clusters as well. Is is this something that you're also looking at? Uh, yeah, hundreds of clusters. So interesting that as well. Right. So I guess this, these are things we can track uh, uh, together. Definitely. And um, you mentioned also the egress gateway for for uh, that you're setting up with a uh, with, uh, custom envoy deployment mm -hmm. and simplifying that yeah and what else was there uh, just taking uh time. our usage uh things like access to force ip uh yeah. more global kind of network policy and uh and then on the security side of things that touch on stuff is pretty interesting right that's a capability yeah, so, uh, so uh, just a note that somebody on my team has started looking at that directly, Tetragon, Cilium, uh, as of last week, but from a security standpoint, so. Nice. Maybe I have a related question, which is uh, regarding, so for, for our load balancers, uh, we have a different solution, because you mentioned tracking the source IP. And uh, we always have this issue if you have like a, a JLS uh, SSL pass through across the load balancer to the back end that you lose the, the initial IP. Um, and we've started enabling the, this proxy protocol uh, to, to be able to, to um, uh, propagate the, the source IP of the client mm -hmm. to the back ends. Uh, you still not lose it through Cube Proxy? Uh, well, this you can fix uh, at the Kubernetes level, though. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but there's the, the configuration. I've tried, I've tried and failed to do that, actually, using um, that external traffic policy. Uh, we OK, that, that's what we are doing. And actually, that works. And mm -hmm. uh, what we were losing was the source IP in the LB because right, okay because of TLS, uh, but with proxy protocol and uh, using something like Nginx for, for the ingress, uh, this is all working. And for the LBs, we are actually using HA proxy with a kind of uh, active passive mode. Okay. Is this something that Cilium would also be potentially a good option for, for the external LB? If, uh, uh, with the external B, I couldn't, I couldn't say at the moment. One thing I've seen was keeping the source IP, but that's, that's kind of a different situation than what you have is the possibility of actually uh, doing, um, uh, routing directly, well, keeping the IP address when accessing the, the service. Uh, and there's two ways of doing this. So there's either a DSR or what was the other way? I don't remember actually. Uh, so there's, there's ways to so so DSR will make it so that the backend will actually reply directly to the to the source IP without routing uh, without doing an SNAT so going back through the node in which it, uh, it, it entered it. 
Uh, but that doesn't really solve your situation, right? Because you want to go through an L7 proxy, right? Yeah. And well, at, at the moment, Cilium doesn't work as an L7 proxy, actually. It works as an L3, L4 proxy. So I, I don't think we would support this. So we have HTTP or HTTPS visibility, um, but Cilium in itself using eBPF, as far as I know, doesn't doesn't do uh, L7 protocol. But but in this case, it would actually be an L4 because it, this is like pure TLS, and uh, and this proxy protocol is actually doing just a blob at the start of the binary packet, and this this blob is understood by some implementations of uh of uh is it, oh yeah you have no tls termination then yeah so it's just a pass through and uh yeah mm -hmm. I, I think it's yeah it's called proxy protocol and it, it's not wildly yeah, yeah. supported but it's supported by nginx H proxy all this stuff okay well i'd have so, to check on this i don't know all right but i think this no. would be pure l4 there's no like we do just it's like tcp no no http all right. Yeah, that would make sense. I'd have to check if proxy protocol would be supporting this. Yeah. Because this could be something that we could look at as well to have um, mm -hmm. to have a solution here for, for LP as well. All right. I don't have anything else. So last uh, last chance for a couple more questions to Raphael. Otherwise, thanks a lot, Rafael, again, and uh, especially for the, the immediate reaction to the call. So that, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. And uh, we'll keep track of, uh, of uh, how, how people start using Cilium also in the research uh, deployments. Thank okay. you. And everyone else, uh, we'll have uh, the next meeting in two weeks, uh, I think. I'm always confused about this first and third. I think it's two weeks. This yeah, time. two weeks. Yeah, a bit. So yeah, we'll we'll circulate the topic in a bit, and then maybe next time we also uh, prepare the topics for at least the rest of the year. Yeah, we need to refresh the backlog because we've uh, run a bit dry recently. Yeah, I can spend some time next 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 uh, session. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks.